Well, the first thing was the three first movies are kind of considered as a trilogy. Of course, when I did them, I didn't consider them as a trilogy. But uh, when I began thinking about this one, I definitely felt it was a departure, mostly because I wanted to talk about grown women, uh, work with professional actresses, and um, dedicate a whole film to a love story. Whereas uh, previously there was always love interest uh, in the films, but they were mostly about self-discovery. So this time I wanted this love dialogue, and also to 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 th there would be also creative dialogue within the um, within the characters. Um, so that was the first thing, and the, the period piece thing came afterward. You know, I didn't want to 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 go. To, uh, I didn't really care about this genre of costume um, films. That's what we call them in France. Um, but wanted to talk about a woman artist, decided to go for painting, went throughout art history and discovered about that special moment where there was this, this great scenery for women artists, the second half of the 18th century. There were hundreds of women painters. When I came upon this reality, it was quite a shock. Um, and it definitely made the urge to make the film um, at that particular moment. But mostly, I think it's the films that should be contemporary forms, and you know, most of the contemporary films, they're not contemporary at all. There's just, you know, kind of, sometimes they feel old school, old fashioned. So I really went, went through this writing and directing, thinking, okay, the fact that it's set in the past is actually a compass to make it uh, profoundly from today. But you didn't want to make like a biopic of a woman painter. You created your characters from scratch. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's pretty singular. That you know, usually period pieces they are kind of adapted uh, from a book or from a character. While well, the book hasn't been written, so you couldn't adapt it. And the, but the characters they were here, as I said, I could have picked one of these women painters who has been erased from art history and take also a body of work that would have been more convenient than created it because that was hard. Um, but I'm not, I don't like this biopic dynamic mostly because it's a uh, strong woman making it in this hard world so it's pretty liberal, it's pretty like, you know, if you want things can happen and I think it's being really unrespectful to the actual journeys of, of these women artists. Um, so I wanted to invent one to think about them all. Um, and also because I really wanted it to be in about a particular moment of her life, her creation, their life actually. We don't even care about the painting. I mean, when it's done, you're not like, this is the painting. You just see it as part of the narrative. You know, you, we show it to say it's over. Um, but we are not that much into the, the art piece. Well, the main idea, the main thing, theme you raise in interviews or, or the theme which was raised by many film critics was of course the idea of um, the gaze, gazing, like uh, love is a gaze, art is a gaze, uh, film, doing a film is a gaze, uh, painting is a gaze, politics is a gaze. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, well, it wasn't my, I didn't have this um, theory that I would make the manifesto for female gays, but in the end, you know, when the critics say it's a manifesto, I'm kind of happy, you know, it's not my job to say it. Um, so that wasn't my plan. I was being kind of candid in a way. Um, but definitely was aware that I was crafting a story where the gaze was actually the plot. Um, gazing at somebody in secret, then the object becoming a subject and going through, and also putting you in a very active position as viewer um, with an active gaze. And that has been the case since my first film, because basically what the Lilies was about uh, being in the girls' locker room and not looking through the keyhole and feeling legitimate. Um, so I want you to f to be authorized to look uh, to, to to and to participate in in, in this uh, the circulation of the gaze. Um, well, we could talk about 
two days about the, the gays. So like I can't I can't go on the TEDx about the gays, but um, um, I was trying to be really really playful, uh, and you know even the first scene is about the painter being already in the position of the model and telling you to look at her. So there's a we are already subverting. Um, the the roles and and the places of each character, even though you don't even know she's a painter yet, we are already being subversive. So the idea is to put you in that position where um, you we will build the grammar of the film, and you will we will create this rhythm, and and you will speak the language of the film. Uh, as as the film goes by, and in the end, like page twenty eight is totally uh, symbolic of the pact that we that the film is making with you and the characters, your equals with the characters. When you see page twenty eight, this is also your love dialogue with the film. So that means that now you share the brain of the film. We have the same brain, and and you understand and speak the language of the film. Thank you. <laughs> the robots are not clapping. <laughs> I was sure that they wouldn't. So you're supposed to be an active audience. Do you already have some questions? Privacy, yeah? Yes. Yes. You're not recorded I think we are recorded yeah but then there are actors who are playing your part and they're asking a question one of them is going to be asked by my mother I think <laughs> who wants to be my mother <laughs> <laughs> it's the European film day so it's part of like um, a streaming uh, thing uh, we are broadcast somewhere we don't know where we don't know where yeah <laughs> maybe in outer space maybe at the I ISS hope it's station. in churches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the aliens will catch that thing, this streaming, like in one million years. That's yes. The question. And in the beginning, it was described, in, I mean, it was shown in much detail the way the, the painter studies Louise, the way she's trying to sort of capture her and understand her. And I was wondering whether it comes from your experience as depicting people in the film. Well, yes, um, and I mean, on the set and in the process of casting, you definitely look at people and especially the face. Like I must say, for instance, I realized that like when I cast Noemi Merlant, for instance, I didn't know her. I hadn't seen her in any films um, and she got the part. And then in the process, we began the costume design, and I realized that I didn't know a body. I didn't know a body. I know a height, but like I went in the workshop where we were tailoring the costumes, and I saw the figures of you know the numbers, and I was like, okay, and you know it tells something. <laughs> I think that I, I think I'm always into the choreography of the faces and I actually the even the beginning of a film is about discovering a face and even the directing process I direct the faces a lot like I would tell them how to breathe when open your mouth close your mouth close your eyes um, that's my interest I'm not answering your question I think but um, and also but Noemi, Noemi says it, um, so that's, I'm going to quote her, because I, I, I didn't notice, but in the process of making the film also, and it tells a lot, lot about our collaboration uh, and how the gaze was actually um, circulating, um, she would look at me looking at Adele to then, when I was doing like the short reverse just for instance, she would look at me and sometimes I would just look and she would be, and I would be, <laughs> like that. And so that she would then perform that gaze and she would also look at the painter who, were, who was a body double, a uh, hand double. Um, and she would actually always look 
at her face also, not only the end, even though she would have to perform what she just did, was mostly about looking at her face. That's my answer. But we will change the question, you know, because yeah. you'll, yeah. <laughs> you'll be an 80-year-old white male. Is it okay? You've been talking about the circulation of gazes between you, Noemi, and, uh, and Adele. We could uh, also add the D.O.P., Claire Maton, and the painter, and the woman who painted uh, those, those paintings, uh, Egan Degmer. Uh, can we can you talk about that? Yeah, she. Mm, that's the first person I casted for the film. Actually, it's uh, Hélène because I. We had to create the visual style of this artist, and we knew that we would take a, a long time. So it was even six six months before shooting. We hadn't all the money yet, but um, I I found her on Instagram. Um, because I was looking for a young contemporary artist who would do oil painting and portraits. Um, and, um, and I went to see her, she knew nothing about movies. Um, so that's why she said yes. <laughs> um, and... Um, why? Sorry? She regretted it? because we didn't know how hard it was going to be, because it's super hard to recreate the visual style of an 18th century painter, obviously, and we didn't try to make it that right, you know. Uh, that's why I decided to work with a contemporary artist and not as a copyist or a specialist, because we, were, we knew we were doing 2018th century, um, and I was interested in that. And as the movie was about a woman artist, a young woman artist, I wanted to work with a young woman artist. Um, no, she said it killed her, but it was a beautiful death. <laughs> and that she it's wouldn't do it for a million dollars. No, but it's because each painting is, 70 hour, is a 70 hour job. And you know, we didn't shoot it chronologically, so she had to do so many frames, so many steps. Because we say, okay, today we're gonna do when you do the eyes. So she would have to do just this figures, then the dress, and so we have t twelve frames, I think, uh, and there's two, there's also two um, portraits. So it was, um, yeah, really, really difficult job. There's an exhibition actually. I think it's in Spain right now, uh, of all the frames. And it's pretty cool. Um, no, no, she, she, she enjoyed it, but, you know, retrospectively I thought, oh, I haven't seen a painter invented in cinema, there's not many. Or, it, or it's, you know, it's Turner, it's Van Gogh, you know them, and you, you, you take the pleasure in seeing those, those art pieces you know being made. Um, but inventing a painter, and an old-fashioned one, I mean, inventing a Jackson Pollock is quite easy, I think. Especially because we make cinema make always makes fun of contemporary painting, which I think is um, terrible. But that's another mm -hmm. subject. Someone else, yeah. Well, you know, the, um, the movie is two hours long. Yeah. I know you know. <laughs> I wish you would have said, oh, I thought it was an hour. It was just, just <laughs> time flew by. Um, um, but there's only 69 sequences, which is very few. I mean, a basic film has a hundred, basically. Also because people are making scenes where you just open the door. But um, I try to make them really full and that each one is a step, but it's that it's not only devoted to one thing also, so that there will be several layers in each scene. Um, but that they would be all really important. And that's also, though, I think, because it's my fourth feature film and I, I wanted to 
you know, you have the experience of something having to do scenes, like I have to do that scene, it's useful, otherwise people won't get that blah, 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 and that she went to the supermarket, so she has to take the car. Um, and from film to film, I'm trying to get rid of this, and this time I really went for like, I'm gonna just watch things that I really want to watch, 100%. And there's no cutscene in the film, for instance. And it's edited in the, as it was scripted, which could seem a little bit scholar and people would be ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that. <laughs> I totally, I'm proud of that. You know, I'm proud of thinking about what I do. But it would look like we're not free and we are not reinventing things, but you know, it should be about inventing them and feel strong about it. Um, I knew that there would be no music in the film, um, which was quite challenging because it's a love story, and every love story has its soundtrack. We could play the game. We're gonna play the game. The robots can't play. <laughs> like Dirty Dancing, Time of My Life. Uh, we're not gonna play the game, you see what I mean? Um, and even in life, all the love stories, they have their soundtrack. Um, but it was because it was a period piece and also because it was about love and art and how art con our love is an education to art and how art consoles us from our loves. Um, and um, I want you, you to be in the same position as um, the characters, you know, 18th century, you find the book, you can read it 20 times, especially where they live, uh, hearing music, you have to go to church. Um, and uh, so I didn't want you to have access to beauty that they wouldn't have access to. And also to, also because the movie is talking about cinema, to, there's no music because you're gonna feel the power of music in cinema. Um, <coughs> and I knew that there would be Vivaldi. Um, and I wanted it to have also an original uh, piece and something that will be like the anthem uh, for the film. I also hope it will be the anthem for uh, the women, French women's soccer team. I told them, I told them, I'm, I want them to go on the field with this song, and they say, why not? I was like, hey, <laughs> if this happens, I stop cinema. <laughs> um, and. I, I wanted it to be super high in BPM, wanted it to be kind of a trance. Uh, and with the Paro and then Arthur Simonini who crafted this, we talked a lot about Ligeti, and um, so not at all 18th century, but it's one of the moments also where we're thinking about Kubrick. We talk about, we thought about Kubrick for that music and also for the candlelights. But that's another subject. Someone else. Yes. Because I want to congratulate you with this beautiful movie. Thank, Thank you, you so much for that. Um, I was wondering uh, if you can uh, talk a little bit more on uh, the choices you made for these two actors. Mm -hmm. Did you get to pick them for that? Well, the film was written with Adele and Elle in mind. We had, had we had done our first feature together and wanted to work together again. So the part was written for her. Um, strangely, you know, people were telling me she's gonna be the painter, and I was no, she's gonna be the model. And uh, politically, it was already weird that people would ask that question. Like that part wouldn't be strong enough for her, even though it's the part the part of the actress. So we were laughing a lot. Um, and as I as I was gonna look and film somebody that I know very well, Adele. I also wanted to meet somebody because that has always been the pleasure of making films for me. Um, but previously they were young children, children or, 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 or teenage girls, so uh, they would not be actors. They would become actors in the process. Um, but I wanted to still have that feeling 
Um, and also because it was a lesbian love story, I wanted everybody to believe in that couple and I'd have the two actresses having the performance. I really wanted to make this strong, iconic duo and the fact that the lead is not identified by uh, by the white audience, I think, is uh, is good for that. I mean, you know, Mulholland Drive, uh, those two actresses, they were like, oh, I mean, she wasn't that big at the time. Um, Naomi uh, Watts. Naomi Watts. David Lynch knows. Um, and um, and so I, I I met a lot of ac young I mean thirty years old actresses a little bit older also and a little bit younger but I didn't want the age gap because I really wanted to build this whole relationship uh, on equality uh, and there's no gender domination so that was easy but also no intellectual domination and no p not playing with the social hierarchy. And that was that was already scripted, but it all became very true in the process of casting. And when I saw Adele and Noemi in the same frame, I felt that new thing, and my heart was racing because there was a strong equality, and I felt like this was gonna be full of surprises for you. That's the beauty of equality. You never know what's going to happen. You know, they make it sound boring. It's not. There's someone else, a thing behind. Yeah. Um, well, we tried to. I mean, homosexuality. Even the world is an anachronistic uh, regarding that time. But um, we're trying to build bridges. We're trying to um, embody what's not been embodied, that is to say, the body <laughs> of these women, their desires. Um, they're, you know, it's, they were officially oppressed at the time. Now it's unofficial. Um, but it's not because you don't have the right to run that you don't want to run. If you're, it's not because you don't have the right to love that you're not full of desire. Um, so it's mostly about yeah the the fact that the intimacy are the same. Uh, the context might be different, but uh, I truly believe that what we are telling is not anachronistic, and that what we're telling hap still happens today this type of love dialogue of relationship. So I'm not trying to wink at the past from the present and I'm not trying to build, to recreate this past f f f as a metaphor for today. I strongly believe that it's, it's, um, it's love. It's the way, it's, it's, their, it's their love dialogue. It's also a lesbian imaginary that exist today and uh, I guess existed before. Someone else? You mentioned in your interview Titanic as an um, mm -hmm. influence on the film. Can you develop that? Draw me like one of your French girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there was no... Well, it was all... <laughs> no. Um, well, no, it wasn't a, d a direct influence. I mean, that scene of uh, DiCaprio's gaze doing like that, and DiCaprio, I mean, was obviously kind of a lesbian at the time. <laughs> yes, that's why it was picked. I mean, that's why the movie was so, I think, universal. It's because they were so gender fluid, both of them. Um, it's not a direct influence, it's just that I've been thinking a lot about the structure of the film because I wanted both the present of a love story and the memory of a love story and the fact that it should be an emancipation. You know, the fact that even though they don't add up together, it's a good thing for the character, the one that is alive anyway. Um, and so I put up this, I crafted this, big flashback and this and I felt, oh, this is good. And then I said, oh, this is Titanic. It's like <laughs> this woman going back in the past and then 
and then it's tragic, it ends, but it's cool because she got to ride the horses and wear pants and live a life in America. So it's, actually I think it's, it ex also explains the huge success of Titanic and I don't understand why my film is not making millions actually. <laughs> <coughs> Should I put a boat? <laughs> um, it's because it was a love story with uh, that with emancipation, with a, a power dynamic that was different, um, and the fact that, yeah, it wasn't about Romeo and Juliet, also DiCaprio, but less interesting. It's not about dying together or, or getting all together. It's not about those storytelling that we had so many times. It was new because it was positive. I mean, and it was about her being more free and more um, alive and more intelligent and more everything after this love story. So that's why it's pretty, it has some common points. But nobody dies. <laughs> and there was room on that door. <laughs> there was room on that door. Everybody agrees that there was room, there on, was that room on that door. That door wasn't designed well. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Someone else? Yes. I have a question about the two locations. It depends quite a bit on the character as well. And I was just wondering if you could have this location in mind. How did you choose it? You shot the film in Brittany. In Brittany, in Quiberon, uh, which is named the Salvage Coast, Côte Sauvage. It's because there is no, it's, there is no, I don't know how you say that, mobilier urbain? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing urban. Signs, stuff. It's virgin. preserved, yeah. So um, you don't have to e erase things after, you know. There's no, there's n it's so vash. Um, and we shot eight days there, the whole, all the exteriors. And then we shot in a castle in the Parisian banlieue. Um, that is um, a city hall, because I visited a lot of castle where people get married and all or, or films are getting shoot, um, shot, but uh, this one was a, yeah, a city hall left untouched. So basically you, I didn't touch anything, like the color of the walls, everything is, hadn't been redone in centuries. And we kept it that way and it actually helped me believe uh, in this world that we were recreating because Previously, most of my sets uh, on my previous film, even though they were contemporary, they were built. And this time, it's kind of the only time that uh, my set was actually true, which is a paradox, but a cool one. Mm. You said in an interview that you wanted this landscape to be very alien, like in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt uh, like the... Like when Eloise, for the first time, she's walking on the beach and she has that cape. We were, we were really thinking that she was a, an intergalactic emperor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it really felt like she would reach the end of the world, you know. Uh, and the very big, big shot, wide shot, where they are running on the beach, really felt like we felt, okay, this is Tatooine. Um, but yeah, to. I mean, you know, you have to believe strongly in what you do when you're doing a period piece because before you say action, it's just somebody in a weird dress and people walking their dog, b bicycles, ling ling, and you're like, what am I doing? In France, we have a film named Les Visiteurs. I don't know if you have it here. <laughs> it's about people coming from medieval time to French France today. It's done 14 million tickets. It's very crowded in France, yeah. And I felt I was doing that. <laughs> Um, so you, you have to choose your lens, you have to believe strongly in, in what you're looking at. Uh, and especially, I, I believe so much in the actors, I don't, uh, that, that's okay. But like the surroundings, it has to mean a lot so that you, you don't give up. Um, and I, I wanted also to convey not only a French imaginary, but you know, it has that uh, weathering rights, uh, you know, more European English uh, aspect of it. 
So I went to Brittany because I thought it would rain and it would be gray, and then we got that amazing sun. <laughs> but cinema is about welcoming what's happening. It's about everything should be a good news. So we decided that the film then would be sunny, and then we, because you know we had done all the exteriors and they were sunny, so then we had to put back the sun in the film, which I think is uh, really, it, it was a good thing. It was a good accident. You say that when you do a period piece, you have to believe in it, and you shot the film in, in digital in very high definition. Mm -hmm. So you, how, why did you didn't choose a film 35 to put a distance or something? Well, I, I, we did uh, essays in digital and in 35 millimeters, and um, I had no hesitation into going for digital for one reason, that was the skin. Uh, the fact that it was all more dynamic and that, you know, it's it's so soft with the 35, but with the digital, you know, if you have a rush of blood, if you're, if you have an emotion, it, you can see it. And as we wanted to give back, to put back the blood in the bodies of these women, we decided to go for this. And we chose very, very high definition, also because of the painting, we were gonna, we wanted, um, this to be shiny, profound, that you would feel uh, the painting. So that's why we, we decided to go for the. And it, it was very difficult because with, mm, with this very, very high definition, there is focus. But like, like that, like the actresses sometimes, if you did that, they were, they would, they were blurry. Blurry? Yeah. Yeah. So. And you know, sometimes Adele would <laughs> shout, I don't know, be very mad because she was yelled like that. And she just, if she did that, it was dead. So imagine the last shot, the pressure on focus guy. <laughs> <laughs> he quit, he quit it. <laughs> Someone else? The last question. Yes. Thank you, one. Uh, the same way as the last half of the fire, so say the response scene from the person who's supposed to burn the movie. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, was that one the first one you did when you thought of doing movies, or was it just like a story kind of based on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one of the first images. Uh, and it's quite emblematic of how we crafted this, because I had the title first. And then I thought, okay, we are gonna really set her on fire. It's not gonna be like this poetic image. This is what the film is going to do. It's like the beginning, like she's arriving on a boat. Well, she's gonna jump in the water, and the film is also gonna jump in the water because we are following her. That level of generosity and embodiment. So it's those kind of scenes that give you the level, you know, uh, of, of yeah, how how far you want to go. Um, and then it's, uh, you know, it's winter, it's 5 a.m., there's a gigantic fire, and you're given this little detonator to actually do <laughs> <laughs> and set this woman you love very much on fire. Well, <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> Yeah, there's a fireman. No, but it's funny, an image like that, you know, you create it in your mind, you write it, and then at some point, it's getting super real. It's about setting somebody for real on fire. And yeah, but at that moment, you really feel you're making cinema, because all the visual effects of the film, they are, they are not uh, CGI, they are not, I mean, everything we did, we did on the set, like, uh, you know, Melies, and um, it's, yeah. Was it the only take, or did you put it on fire many times? Many times. Many times? <laughs> <laughs> I had three times, and uh, the second time was the, there was one time very, because she was standing behind the flames, so I would set her on fire, and then didn't know how it will come out. So maybe it would come out this big, or this. And like the first time it was, well, okay. The second time, we did a little bit hard. The third time, it was just <laughs> it was so disappointing. Um, 
but yeah, it's and she's all. I mean, she's all covered in. I mean, you know, it's and she has to put her hands this way, and it's. But she wasn't. She wasn't scared. She's brave. She's brave. She's, she's really time. brave. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Time's up. As they say. As they say. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Sigrid, for this thank very you, beautiful film, moving and very topical and political. Thank, thank you. you.